And I think that that is an amazing lesson for, for today as we look at the state of the world and we're always wanting to, you know, get more power, get, get more attention, get more fame, but look at what that costs and look how it hurts the people around you. And I think that goes back to looking at, you know, how the, uh, the women in these, in these plays are portrayed, Clemenestra and uh, Medea. <music> Hi, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, you get my conversations with peak performing thought leaders, creatives, and entrepreneurs. We explore how you can innovate through creativity, compassion, and collaboration. I believe that innovation combined with compassion and creative thinking can save the world, and I aim to bring you ways you can do it too. If you're enjoying the show, I'd be super grateful if you can support it by buying me a cup of coffee. You can buy me a cuppa at buymeacoffee.com slash Isolde T. And now, let's get on with the show. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. I'm super happy that you're here, and I'm really honored and happy to have today's guest on the show. Check this out, and you will know that that my inner Greek mythology nerd is going to be so super happy to talk to this gentleman. Adam Oliver Stokes holds degrees in religion from Duke University and Yale Divinity School. He has published on a variety of topics, including biblical studies, Mormon studies, classical studies, and ancient American history. He's the author of three books, From Egypt to Ohio, A Semitic Origin for the Giants of North America. Can't wait to talk about that one. Perspectives on the Old Testament and the Latin Scrolls, Selections from the Five Megilot Taken from the Latin Vulgate. He currently teaches Latin at Penns Grove High School in New Jersey and lives in Edgewater Park, New Jersey with his wife and two sons. How exciting is this going to be? Adam, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Great to be here, Zola. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you. In part because just let's just jump on in. What got you started? I know what got me started reading Bullfinch's mythology when I was nine years old. What got you started? What fascinated you about this, these ancient cultures and civilizations that you decided to make it your life's work? Yeah, well, I think it goes way back to my seventh grade Latin teacher, Mr. Buto. Uh, my parents, my mom forced me to take Latin. I went in kicking and screaming. Um, my dad thought it was kind of a pointless class to take. He thought it was, you know, a dead language. Um, but uh, into about a week or so of the class, this was my goodness, as old as this is about almost 30 years ago, into about a week into the class, I was hooked. And the reason I was hooked is that uh, Mr. Buto was kind of an unconventional Latin teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, Not saying, I mean, he knew his stuff left and right. Um, Definitely uh, one of the finest uh, linguists I've ever ever encountered in my life. Um, But he made it interesting for us. There's a way to teach Latin where it can be really boring Mm -hmm. and uh, just uh, really dry. And he just, how can I say it? he, he spiced it up. He brought in a lot of Roman history. He brought in a lot of mythology. And I think at the time um, I was in middle school going into high school, um, I was kind of a nerd. I was kind of one of the awkward kids, didn't really quite fit in. So uh, the ancient world was kind of my escape. And I just I just fell in love with it, uh, basically from, from the first time I started to engage in it. And I knew that in college, I wanted my trajectory uh, to be my trajectory to be uh, towards looking at uh, ancient civilizations. I love that a teacher inspired you to this because, yeah, there are a lot of people who think Latin is a dead language, but it's the root of so many languages that knowing it can only be of benefit. So let me ask you a question. You're, you teach Latin. Do you spice it up for your students? And if so, what is it that you do? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, um, my school, I, I love, I absolutely love the school that I teach at Penn's Grove. To give you some of the demographics about that school, about 40% of that school, is, of the school I teach at, is uh, made up of Latino students, Latino mm-hmm. and Latina students. So they come in with Spanish, and it's really cool because I can hook them early on and say, you know, Spanish comes directly uh, from Latin. So I bring in a lot of, a lot of my focus is looking at uh, the ways that Spanish intersects with Latin, what words are exactly the same 
as in Spanish as they are in Latin. So for example, uh, to geek out here, uh, the second person uh, singular two is the mm -hmm. same in Spanish as it is in Latin. Um, but I also do a lot of what Mr. Buto did as well. We, we're always, in fact, sometimes we do more Roman history and Greek mythology than translation of text uh, themselves. Uh, so we've looked at basically uh, everything from uh, the Iliad to the Odyssey. Uh, we've looked at the various Roman emperors. I really like the bad emperors, the naughty emperors. Um, the ones <laughs> who are who the naughty trouble. emperors? Oh gosh, uh, well, there's a bunch of them, but I'll, I'll say uh, we focus a lot on uh, Caligula, we also focus uh, on uh, Nero. So those are the bad guys. Mm. My favorite emperor, he wasn't actually bad, but I always highlight him. And we must spend about a month on this guy is the emperor Claudius. And the reason that I do that is because uh, Claudius um, likely, well, one, there was a whole mini series of him with uh, my uh, favorite actor who I would gladly divorce my wife for and marry, <laughs> Der Derek Jacoby, um, Sir Wonderful. Derek Jacoby, whom yeah. I absolutely love. Um, but also, um, we know from sources that uh, Claudius had some type of uh, disability, that he was possibly autistic or, or something like that. And so um, I have uh, some students who uh, are dealing with disabilities themselves, so I always point to him, and students always seem to appreciate this, I point to him and say, you know, this was a guy who, in spite of his disability, rose to be uh, the emperor, the ruler of the known world at the time. And uh, he's just a fascinating figure, not only for himself, but the way that he intersects with all these different other figures in history, uh, Caligula, Herod, Agrippa um, in, uh, in Jewish history, um, Tiberius, um, Augustus. Um, he intersects with basically all the greats. Um, so we do a lot of stuff uh, with the emperors. I actually have like an emperor battle that they have to do, they have to argue effectively. So get into little uh, small groups and they have to argue effectively which emperor was the worst. So there'll be uh, Nero or Caligula and they have to give the reasons why, or they'll even, um, this is a project I'm gonna have them do in the upcoming months. Um, they will uh, choose an emperor and kind of have to do a campaign for that emperor. So if you want to get this emperor elected, if you want to get him voted into office, uh, which of course didn't happen in the Roman world, the emperors just were, were chosen to be emperor or, uh, from their lineage, but if you were, if it was modern times and you were trying to get, you know, Nero elected, uh, what could you do uh, to get him? Uh, what would you say about him? How would you depict him to get elected? So there's campaign slogans and all that stuff. Now, is this all in Latin? Uh, some, uh, most of it is, yes. So wow. um, they'll, uh, so a lot of their projects, they'll uh, basically write out a slogan um, in Latin, so, um, or write out a description uh, in Latin. So they'll, trans they'll write out something in English translate into Latin, and then uh, use that as a template. That's so incredible. And I love that you do that, that you get them so engaged and involved and not just sitting down, which I think is phenomenal because often just sitting down for a long time, no matter what you're studying, is going to be tougher on a student yes. than, than uh, getting up and actually doing and having a campaign. So what is the best slogan someone's ever come up with for one of the emperors? Um, I think so. I did a similar project um, at the school I taught at uh, earlier before I came to Penn's Grove. And I think uh, the best one was um, at least this emperor won't feed you to the lions. Uh, so I think it was uh, Titus or Vespasian and comparing him to Nero. Um, I think they were they were the two emperors up for election. And uh, yeah, I think that that one I always get a kick out of. So, you know, it can't be as bad as getting fed to the lions. That's actually probably true. So <laughs> let me, it's, I love, I love what you do as a teacher, but you're also an author and you, you write and you publish works. And I know that this is, this is going to sound a little weird, but when, when you're doing this, when you're, when you're writing, you're writing for a modern audience, writing for a contemporary 2021 audience. Yeah. And you're writing about these things that happened thousands of years ago, perhaps even longer. How do you make how do you make it relevant to the audience of 2021? And what lessons can we as your readers learn to take into our future from from these ancient civilizations and ancient stories? 
That's that's a great question. Um, and that's something that is always, like you said, a challenge for anybody trying to, you know, uh, convey ancient history to modern readers. Um, I've read so many, uh, not to knock other uh, textbooks, but especially within biblical studies and Old Testament, there's so many textbooks that just give dry explanations of, of things. So um, you'll read a textbook and they'll say, these are the books of the Hebrew Bible, this is their content, blah, 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 blah. But it doesn't really talk about, you know, how this stuff is relevant today. And even though the Bible was written thousands of years ago, uh, for one, uh, it is, you know, a text that is uh, still accepted as scripture by uh, large groups of people today, Jews and Christians. And uh, also, um, I think just because it ha was the primary Western document for so long, it continues to have effects, both good and bad, uh, for, for our culture and for our society. Um, and so one of the challenges and one of the things that I tried to do in writing both perspectives of the Old Testament and uh, the Latin scrolls was to show uh, the how uh, the Bible, um, or at least how people, how pop cultures understood the Bible still has implications for issues that we, that we deal with uh, today. So in my perspectives of the Old Testament book, um, there's an article in there um, about uh, the treatment of Israelites towards foreigners. And I tied that article directly into the current uh, discussion about immigration and treatment of foreigners um, here in America uh, when, um, at a time when uh, there is there's increased uh, xenophobia. Um, in my other book, The Latin Scrolls, um, there's actually, and I was advised to do this by my editor, and I think it was a great idea, um, Isolde, um, I was advised to put a section at the end of each of the Megillo, each of the scrolls that um, I translated, uh, what is the relevance of this scroll for today? Um, so uh, at, at the end of uh, each of the translations, there's discussion about you know, the contemporary relevance of, of uh, the content in each of the scrolls. Um, so for example, uh, the scroll to the book of Esther, um, I say, well, Esther was this average person who suddenly uh, got skyrocketed, you know, to to the the highest um, the highest status in society. She uh, suddenly was thrust into the court of the most powerful people in the world. Uh, what happens when uh, this happens uh, to you? And I gave an example from my own life. Um, I actually, when I was at Duke, um, just uh, little known me from from Baltimore, five foot two actually got in the same class with the Prince of Jordan and actually became friends with him. And mm. so I cited that as an example, you know, what do you do uh, when you um, basically, you um, encounter a situation where you're suddenly thrust amongst uh, very powerful people? Um, what ways might, you know, you uh, use this not only to your own benefit, not to sound selfish, but also to the benefit of others um, as Esther does. Um, so I try to raise questions like that. Um, Song of Songs, for example, another one of the Megalote. Uh, what does this say about sexuality? You know, we think of we think of sex, and you know, we think of something you know that is I think still in still in the modern West, um, due to the influence um, of of Christianity for so long, we think of sex as something that you know is is taboo. Um, but you know. What does Song of Songs say about you know sex? This is a very healthy sexual relationship. How might this be relevant? How might this differ from you know talking to my college students, many of whom come from Catholic, uh, strong Catholic backgrounds? How might this differ from what you've heard? How might this be a positive way of understanding you know sexuality? So I, I do bring that stuff in. I, I bring that stuff in. Try to bring it in quite often, um, and it makes the class much more interesting. Some of the reflection papers I get from students, some of the ways that they answer these are, are really, uh, are really, really profound. And they, they stick with me just as much as I hope my class sticks with them. It's so interesting to me how often as a teacher, you learn from your students almost as much as they learn oh, from yes. you. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. So when you're in that, when you're in that state, and you're looking at something, a, a document like the, the Old Testament, and you see some things, that the Song of Songs is a great example of something that 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 we can really learn from and that can be of benefit of, of increasing kindness and tolerance towards people who are not the same as you, especially and yes. also immigration with xenophobia. And yet there are times when you look at something like the Bible and you go, really, 
you believe <laughs> that, you know, yeah. don't eat crustaceans or, or yes. don't mix your fabrics or whatever. So how do we as modern people uh, incorporate that into our viewpoint of a document like the Old Testament? Because some of it, frankly, is is just so jarring, like don't, you know, some of the stuff that's that's pretty violent and some of the stuff that that make doesn't make a lot of sense like don't yeah. eat crustaceans or whatever or, or i'm i'm vegan so it's easy for me not to eat crustaceans and not and not to eat uh pigs but at the same time how do we do that how do we reconcile in our own selves when we, when we see such such guidance and advice that is so uh dated i'll say yeah yeah and i always um I do a section on uh, the Abraham tradition in the book of Genesis. And I always get to that horrible uh, chapter in Genesis 18, where um, the angels come to Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot basically uh, says, you know, um, to the men of the city, you know, I'll just don't do anything to these male angels, but I'll throw my daughters out of the door to you um, so that uh, you can, you can have your way with them. Um, so, and that's a, one of many jarring, uh, many jarring scenes in the Old Testament. I think uh, the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible has to be taken like any other uh, historical text. Now, granted, it's had much more of an influence than some other ancient texts have. But I think, um, as uh, I think Jesus would say, you have to kind of separate the wheat from the chaff. Um, recognize um, that, and I think that biblical scholarship uh, having its basis in the European Enlightenment and people like Spinoza, I think, uh, it does as well. Recognize that this is an ancient text written by human beings, that their morals, uh, the morals of their time are much different than the morals of our time. But there's still stuff that uh, you can wean from this from certain books, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, um, et cetera, uh, that uh, still have value uh, for today and how we uh, interact and uh, how we treat others. So I think... Um, Excellent example. I heard a lecture. I can't remember who gave the lecture, um, but it was um, a woman who does, uh, who's a classicist, and I'm, I'm blanking on her name right now. She did a lecture on the Iliad and basically saying, you know, um, this, uh, basically the mindset of all these guys in the Iliad just for, you know, blood, uh, bloodshed and plunder uh, that you get with Agamemnon and Achilles and basically all of them. They're, they're all kind of uh, all kind of crud in that regard. Mm. Uh, but uh, you can also still take away uh, some moral lessons uh, from from Homer, uh, not just the Iliad, but she was talking about the Odyssey as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, basically, you know, what does it mean to be a virtuous person? Now, virtue looks different for someone like Achilles or Agamemnon, you know, uh, 2,500 years ago. But I think we can still ask that question as modern people, what does it mean to be virtuous in our time? What does it mean to be noble in our time. Um, and uh, the, the writings of Homer and the other Greek classics bring these questions uh, to mind. Those questions are timeless, those questions are eternal, and uh, they'll be around uh, long after we aren't. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. The, those questions are timeless. Some of the answers make me cringe, but yes. <laughs> the questions themselves, you know, all you have to do is look at something like the Oristia and, and yes. wow, you know, what, <laughs> what, what happened there was just, you know, Hot wow. Mess. So, so when I look at those, when I look at those ancient texts and I look at, you know, oh, you killed my father. So now I'm going to kill you and this and that, and, Everybody you know, else. and, and yep. then I'm gonna, because he's, he sacrificed the daughter and all of these different things. Mm -hmm. I look at that and I go, okay, if Clytemnestra, let's say she was in that, she played, she was the wife in the Orstaya and she, her, her husband, the king, sacrificed his daughter. daughter yeah. All of these things happened. And so she was taking revenge, right? She was taking revenge and she also had a lover and all of the, it's a very dramatic and exciting and, and bloody story. Oh, yes. So, so, but that's, that's what was, this is, this is going to be a, a very feminist question. What was the woman's role here? What kind of power did Clytemnestra have besides doing what she did in that time? And how do we, again, as modern people look at these tales and say, okay, this is maybe what Clytemnestra could do. This is what the path that was open to her or, or the Medea. Medea is another yeah. great example. Yeah. What could we do as women in those times versus what lessons we can learn in modern times from these ancient tales? 
Yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, you know, I think that a lot of the, the Greek tales, especially, I think there's a subliminal message of sympathy for these women like Clymenestra, like Medea, in, you know, saying that, you know, they are kind of, they're kind of literally restrained mm. by the culture and the time period uh, that they find themselves in and being married to these men who have absolute power and are kind of, I think, especially with Agamemnon, uh, kind of absolutely narcissistic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what else could they do? So I think that there's definitely when you read the when you read the Greek plays, Sophocles, Euripides, um, et cetera, there is always an edge of, at least in my, at least how I read them, of sympathy for these women. You know, Clemenestra is not just this uh, terrible, uh, unfaithful uh, woman who kills, who kills Agamemnon, who kills her spouse, but, you know, look at the context that set this up. And I think a lot of the Greek playwrights are saying, you know, let this be a warning of what absolute power does because mm. Agamemnon, uh, he destroyed with, he destroyed a lot of people around him and eventually he destroys himself. His actions destroy himself. Mm -hmm. um, and every step he takes to try and gain more power, including uh, s uh, sacrificing uh, his daughter, eventually leads uh, to his downfall. And I think that that is an amazing lesson uh, for, for today as we look at the state of the world and we're always, you know, wanting to, you know, get more power, get, uh, get more attention, get more fame, but, you know, look at, look at what that costs and look how it hurts the people around you. And I think that goes back, you know, to looking at, you know, how the, uh, the women in these, in these plays are portrayed, Clemenestra and uh, Medea. It's so interesting. It goes right back to what you said earlier about virtue and what does it mean to be a virtuous person. And now I'm getting into the nitty and the gritty of my my Greek mythology and yeah, Greek go for history. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, could, I, I could talk to you about this stuff all day. I love this. Awesome. So yeah, because I, as you as you might be able to tell, I'm a nerd for this. So so okay. So take something like the story of Antigone. When she's in that position, she she claims power. She goes and she buries her brother. And against the king's wishes, and then she pays, a, 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 obviously, a pretty hefty price. What, again, what do we do? What do we do now as far as activism? How do we relate that to people wanting, like, to, to Black Lives Matter movement, the, the, the Me yeah. Too movement? All of those movements are those kinds of protests. And in, 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 the, in the ancient plays, there was death to come now we are in a hopefully much more enlightened place but still we are faced with the same question what am i risking if i speak up what am i risking if i take action like antigone did yeah um i think that that's a really good point and i think you know yes we don't risk death uh per se hopefully not, you know, hopefully not but i know that you know i have some activist friends um, I used to teach at a uh, Unitarian seminary uh, way back in the day, and a lot of my uh, a lot of the students that I taught uh, went on to to be activists. Um, I even had uh, some at in, at Charleston in 2017. I don't know if you recall that event mm, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, with the um, of course white supremacist. Um, but um, being an activist, from what I've heard of activists, I, I'm not an activist. Um, um, Part of me feels ashamed about that, but I'm, I'm not really an activist uh, per se, uh, but I admire activists. I, I greatly admire, uh, admire activists. And from what they have told me, it is, it is a taxing thing. So you don't, you know, it's not necessarily that your life is in danger. Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it is, but that the mental burden of, you know, of seeing all the problems in the world and trying to do something about it and feeling like you're just making, you know, baby steps and, you know, just such small head, you know, just little headway um, is it, sometimes, you know, really overwhelming. And so I know that, you know, a lot of activists struggle, you know, with issues of issue, issues of mental health. So I think going back to Antigone, uh, you know, making, I, I think that's a great example because at the end, it comes down to what type of decision does she make? She can mm -hmm. back off and, you know, just have everything go back to normal, or she can, uh, she can protest and be defiant. And what is the cost of that? And I think that's a, that's an extremely relevant question, you know, for, uh, for today, you know, even, you know, if, if 
like I said, there's no physical harm that comes to you. There is going to be some type of cost uh, when you when you serve as an activist in the way uh, in, in in a positive way. So um, there is going to be some type of mental cost, mental toll that it takes on you. And um, are you are you ready? You know, are you ready for that? Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Oh, it absolutely does. And, and it, you know, we, we all have to evaluate for ourselves what we're going to do and how we're going to do it for sure. And I, I, I do want to say something, Adam, that I, that I want to make, I want to make this point very clear. Consider yourself an activist. You have taken on the extremely important job of teaching the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. If that's not an activist I don't know what is, honestly. So Thank please you. do not ever be ashamed of not being perhaps on the front line at a march. You are an activist every single day when you walk into the classroom and you help these students, your students, discover and and get curious and ask questions and, and make suppositions and learn. That that is if I were if I were queen, honestly, or empress, uh professional basketball players would be making $30,000 a year and teachers would be making in the millions. So, so I, I, I wanted to say that that's really important for me that you understand. I hold you in the highest regard because you've taken on what I consider to be a sacred task. Thank you. Thank you. I, I definitely, I, I consider it, you know, sacred as sacred as well. I, my mother was a teacher. She taught for 40 years. Um, and I saw how she influenced people so much, even years after, um, and literally in the trenches of Baltimore, she literally saved some lives by the direction she was able to put students on. Um, and so I always admired her, that about her. I mentioned Mr. Buto before. Mm-hmm. So um, these are all people that I've looked up to. And I, I definitely, I felt that their calling was sacred. And I feel like teachers' callings are sacred now. And at least in America, I don't think we, uh, teachers get enough praise. Oh, not, not, not even a little. I've spent, I've spent time working with teachers and I go into schools to teach and one of my other gigs. And teachers are heroes every single one of you you're amazing uh i i want to if it's okay to switch gears just a little bit and certainly perhaps switch oceans maybe cross an ocean and let's cross the atlantic and let's talk about ancient civilizations on the north american continent honestly this is something that i uh i've done some research before this interview but i don't really know anything about it and and yet I've been to Snake Canyon and I've spent time in the Southwest, but I, I would love to, to speak with you a little bit about what, what that's about for you. What sparked your interest in ancient American civilizations and what are your beliefs about these civilizations? Because there's some, there's plenty of stuff we just don't know. Yes. So, so what do you, what got you started and, and what is your focus about that? Yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to talk about that. So, what got me started, honestly, um, Isolda, were was my uh, were my religious views, and I'll say a little bit um, about that. Um, so, I was raised Baptist then um, for most of my life. Then, when I got to grad school, kind of had a crisis of faith. I uh, didn't really have any affiliation for a few years. Um, then, uh, spent some time with the Quakers. And then uh, joined uh, one of the Latter-day Saint movements, not uh, the main one that you know of in Utah, uh, but I'm an elder in uh, what's known as the Church of Christ uh, with the Elijah message. Um, And all of the Latter-day Saint traditions, community of Christ, um, the uh, Utah church, um, the Bickertonite church, uh, we are all kind of, um, how can I say, what the uh, thing that holds us all together is our belief in something called the Book of Mormon or the record of uh, the Nephites, as uh, as my denomination calls it, um, and in that in uh, the Book of Mormon, I'll just use the more common name. Uh, there's the idea that there were ancient civilizations that existed in North America, and that at some point Jesus came and visited these ancient civilizations. Now that is hmm. a faith claim. I'm not going to uh, argue for that one way or another here on this show, but I will say that it got me very interested in trying to see um, and trying to research uh, what ancient American civilization was like, because um, I'm sure it's probably the same for you, but when I was growing up, um, basically uh, when you asked about uh, ancient American civilization, you were told of the pilgrims and uh, they had a nice Thanksgiving meal with the Native Americans. 
and uh, that was it. Now, you knew a little bit about South America uh, with the Mayans and the Incans, but no Incas, but nobody um, and the Aztecs, but nobody ever really um, nobody ever really talks about uh, North America pre uh, 1492. So uh, really my uh, my interest in, you know, what can we know about ancient civilizations in America uh, stemming from my my kind of religious background? Uh, made me get into this topic. And uh, from my own research, from what I've been able to ascertain, uh, North America just had just as much of a rich, um, elaborate culture with uh, huge empires, thinking of the empires of the Hopewell and the Adena peoples, just as extensive, just as amazing as the empires of South America. That's fascinating. So if that if that is true, if we have civilizations in sort of more north of of where the Mayans and the Aztecs and Incas were, uh, okay, I, I let's see if I can figure out how to ask this question. A few years ago, I visited Acoma Pueblo in New Mexico, and it's yes. it's the most it's the only continuously in existence town or city uh, or community, I should say. Uh, for since the 11th century, right? So, yes. so they've been around for a while, in part because they're so isolated. They're up on a big rock in the middle yes. of the desert. So, so those folks have been around, and we have some sort of continuous records of of that happening. But, yes. but what are the records that show that that some of the more in sort of northern American civilizations were in existence? When and again, I don't. I don't. I'm. I'm asking. I, I'm not trying to be impertinent or anything. I'm, I don't. I've never heard of primary sources that yeah. talk about the existence of these sorts of civilizations and and peoples as yes. you're talking about. Please no, enlighten me. <laughs> no, that's that's a really good question. Most people haven't. I mean, I hadn't heard of this until I started uh, doing research. Um, for it myself. There are not a lot of written records. Now we do have some inscriptions, um, some Semitic inscriptions from some of these sites which suggest that uh, some of these early North American empires came from uh, the Near East. And there's a lot of debate as to whether these inscriptions are forgeries or if they're legitimate. I tend to have, I tend to side on the view that they're legitimate well, when you look at them. Uh, with my background, I have a background in Semitic languages, Hebrew and Aramaic. Um, so, um, but not just the written records, um, mainly through the archaeological records. So, um, one of the things that I do, um, as kind of the geek in me, um, I travel around to, uh, various Native American mounds. And I, I, um, have often taken my kids, I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, so I take them with me, um, basically all the time. Um, and they get kind of bored. They're like, daddy's looking at his clumps of dirt again. But <laughs> back in the day, thousands of years ago, they weren't actually uh, clumps of dirt. They've been uh, destroyed uh, by, uh, by uh, present, um, present inhabit the present inhabitants of, of, of the region uh, now. But um, back in the day, uh, these mounds uh, were huge. And some of them were as big as the dimensions of uh, the pyramids of Egypt. And in the 19th century, um, as people have still found this stuff, some of this stuff today, um, there were excavated um, in a, at a lot of these mounds, uh, people, uh, or excuse me, uh, remains, uh, skeletal remains of people who seem to have been rulers or decorated with jewelry, uh, with um, all types of fancy items. Um, and they also seem to have been slight, uh, slightly to somewhat significantly taller uh, than uh, than uh, modern human beings uh, presently. So between seven uh, to nine uh, feet. So uh, we know that these people were royalty of some type. They seem to have ruled uh, the region uh, around them. And we have this not only from what we've been able to determine from the archeological record, but also uh, from just the traditions of uh, Native Americans. Native Americans talk about people uh, who were there, who were here uh, before and uh, contemporaneous uh, with their ancestors and um, how these people basically, um, yeah, basically uh, were the rulers of, of uh, these different civilizations that you have in the Midwest and in the Great Lakes region, um, et cetera. So um, short answer to your, to your question, to your uh, really good question. 
um, the archaeological evidence um, and uh, the oral traditions of the Native Americans uh, seem to strongly point to a, a massive empire uh, in North America. I grew up in Michigan and uh, lived there until after I graduated from the University of Michigan. And one of the places that we went to was Serpent Mound. And, yes. uh, and so that, and I remember being there and I could feel the energy of the place was different when you were nearby there. It was, it just felt different than when you were a few miles away. Yeah. And so I, you know, they say that it's, that it was, one of them was created by the Adena culture in yes. like 500, 800 BC to somewhere around there. Can you talk about what the significance, because we don't exactly know why that serpent mound is there. And I'm going to have to find a picture of it and put it up in the show notes for this, because, you know, you, you can see that it's there when you're there, but really it's best seen from above. So, yeah. so can you talk about what the significance of the serpent mound is? And well, what is it first of all, and what the significance of it is to someone like you who studies North American ancient cultures. Certainly, certainly. I have not, um, sadly, I haven't been to the Serpent Man. I've been <sighs> to some others. I've been to the Newark uh, Earthworks. I've been to the Fort Ancient uh, Mound. Um, I've been to the Adena Mound in Kentucky, uh, but I have not yet gone to the Serpent Mound, but it's something that I hope to do, uh, maybe a summer road trip with the kids, I will, I will do it. Uh, but yeah, the Serpent Mound is one of the longest uh, stretches just by its by by feet one of the longest mounds uh, that exist um, in North America and as you said it's attributed to the Adena people um, who uh, live between uh, 500 BCE and I believe 100 CE um, depending some people uh, debate that some people say 500 uh, BCE to 400 uh, CE um, there seem to have been two major cultures uh, in that region the Adena and the Hopewell and they seem to have uh, fought with each other. And we don't actually know their original names. Hopewell and Adina were much later names given to them, uh, named after the people um, who, uh, who basically found, found their relics. Um, so we don't know what their original names were. Um, but uh, yeah, so this serpent mound, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's really something that you can only see really well, just like the Newark mound uh, from above when you're actually there. Um, you, uh, you can't really see it very well, um, but we don't know why uh, that, uh, that serpent is there. There's a, there's a bunch of theories about that, um, that uh, this serpent may represent some form of uh, Gnosticism or Gnostic religion um, amongst the Adena. Um, the Adena, I should mention, along with the Hope Well, a lot of people, including myself, have speculated that their origins um, come from uh, the Near East. So uh, this could represent uh, a reference to the biblical serpent tradition, um, where you have you have the serpent featuring uh, featuring prominently in uh, the beginning of the Old Testament uh, in the books of Genesis, um, or it could be uh, the Gnostic serpent uh, who provides uh, who provides wisdom. Um, so uh, in the ancient Near East, uh, in ancient Near Eastern uh, context, serpents as well as women were uh, understood as harbingers of wisdom. That's why in the Genesis story, Eve is talking uh, to the serpent. The serpent's not interested in the guy because the uh, serpent doesn't feel like the dude is all that wise, but he is talking to the woman because <laughs> they're kindred spirits because um, they're both seen as harbingers of wisdom. So um, a lot of scholars, um, as Zolda have said, you know, we're not sure uh, what all of these mounds symbolized, but they were possibly used for ceremonial or religious purposes and maybe some type of Gnostic ritual, Gnostic religious purpose uh, was, um, was uh, evident at the Serpent Mound. Um, but it's something, I, I think this points to basically a larger issue that, you know, a lot more work. Now you have great archeologists um, in the field of American archeology, span but a lot of this stuff has really kind of, kind of been overlooked um, and, you know, I think when you get to the mounds, a lot of archaeologists are content with the, with the explanation that they're just ceremonial and don't really go into more depth 
uh, with them. So I think that a lot of the new researchers out there, um, including myself, um, are trying to, you know, really get into this and say, you know, yes, we see that there's this funky symbol here, but what can we possibly determine about it? Um, is it more than just, if it is ceremonial, what is the ceremony per se? Can we reconstruct um, any idea of uh, what of uh, the religious use of, you know, this particular mound site or that particular uh, mound site? I'm taking it all in for a second because there's there's so much to what you just said. So, here I am. I am looking at the Serpent Mound or some of the other bandolier in, in New Mexico, some of these places where people have left an indelible mark of, of that they were there. Whether or not yes. we know what it meant, somebody went, I'm going to I'm going to let you know. I'm going to have this, you know, for posterity, if you will. Not that they necessarily meant to do that, but it was it was a way of marking what was happening there. Yeah. And a few years, I, I go to Ireland a lot. And when, when we were traveling, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, I go to Ireland a lot. And I've spent time at the Hill of Tara. Oh, wow. And it's and Newgrange. And, and so Newgrange is 5,000 years old or even older than that, maybe 7,000 years old. I believe it's 5,000 BCE is when it was built over, over time, of course. But uh, again, there are things there that when, you, when you're there, there, there are... Uh, at the at the winter solstice in Newgrange, for example, you are going to see the sun shine in at the winter solstice and the two days around that date, the sun shines in all the way down 90 meters into the central altar and it's the only time of the year it does that so they knew to build it that way and the same thing happens on uh, uh, the equinoxes in Tulum in Mexico, the same kind of somebody went, you know what, we honor this so much that we're going to make this happen and, and Stonehenge and other such yeah. uh, structures, if you will. So do we have any instance of this in this part of Mexico? Yes, but but we're talking here specifically about sort of, I think, the Americas and the North American part of North America. Uh and I hope I didn't just say something really insulting to anyone who lives in Mexico, but I, I guess what, what would now be considered the United States or Canada. Do we have anything like that here that we can point to and go, yeah, there, somebody put thought, that sort of thought into this, this uh, the placement of, of these mounds or these, or these structures? Oh, yes. Um, so there is a researcher, Sarah Farmer, and she goes into kind of uh, into much more detail um, than I can about uh, basically the astrological alignment of many of these mounds. Um, and she argues that both with uh, the solar and lunar calendar, uh, they are aligned. So many of these seem to be um, astronomically aligned. Um, so uh, suggesting that, you know, exact thought, exact uh there was an exact specific purpose to building these mounds. Mm -hmm. um, last uh, October, I was for a church conference in uh, Kentucky and I got to see, I mentioned this before, uh, the Adena Mound mm -hmm. uh, there. And the Adena Mound in Kentucky, in Lexington, Kentucky is really interesting uh, because you can't see it any, you can't uh, see this exactly anymore because the river is dried up. But thousands of years ago, there was a river that ran uh, parallel to uh, the mound. So there's a small mound, there's mm -hmm. a, a river, then there's a small mound, and then there's a bigger mound uh, next to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is interesting because uh, we know some people, um, some other scholars have written on this as well, uh, such as uh, Dr. Greg Little. Um, but uh, the river uh, was seen um, not just in Native American thought, but you get this in the Bible as well as a transition between uh, life and death. Sure. Um, so um, it is believed that uh, the river was either the river of pre-mortality, where the soul uh, slowly starts to make, makes, it, makes its way into the world. So the soul moves from the river to the small mound, and then the big mound, which represents human existence. Or it could be the opposite way of um, the uh, soul uh, leaving the physical, uh, the physical realm with the big mound. Uh, eventually uh, entering the realm of the dead and then crossing over into the afterlife with uh, the river. We're not quite sure either interpretation uh, could, uh, could be argued for, um, but 
uh, in that instance, um, I think is an excellent example where this mound is, where you have mound building that seems to be deliberately planned. They mm -hmm. deliberately plan to build this mound near this river to kind of re reflect um, a, a, spiritual, a spiritual belief they had. Some sort of a crossing over like the river Styx. If we yes, go back exactly. To In Greek mythology. mythology. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good example. Uh, so going back to this, this, this notion of the modern lessons that we can learn, I, I was at a conference many years ago with Daniel Hillel. I don't know if you know who he is, biblical scholar and yes, soil yes. scientist. And one of the things that he said was that when you look at the Old Testament in the Aramaic, that it's not dominion over the earth and the animals, that it's more like stewardship or caretaking. Yes. And it changes everything. If you if you start ascribing that, that, that the notion of being caretakers rather than having dominion over our environment, over the beings we share the planet with, uh, it changes that notion of virtue and, and that notion of how how responsible we are not to but for all of the different incredible natural resources we have. Yeah. So when you're working and you're an Aramaic scholar and a Hebrew scholar, when you're working on something like that, when you're looking at these old documents, can you talk a little bit about that notion of, am I choosing the right words? What do I have to do to make sure that I bring across the actual meaning of what is being said when something like dominion versus stewardship or yeah. caretaking has made such a significant difference in how many people view our relationship to the planet we live on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a really kind of, I think that's an excellent example of kind of uh, a negative history of interpretation. Uh, people taking um, the Hebrew uh, term actually is mashal. So it means uh, like exactly like you said, nurturing, uh, tender care, uh, for the environment. And you see this elsewhere in the Hebrew Torah um, in Leviticus. This is something I talk about with my with uh, my students in my Old Testament class, this environmental ethos that Leviticus has. Now we read Leviticus, we read Leviticus 18 and we're like, oh crap. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff <laughs> in Leviticus that, um, yeah, that is problematic. But the thing that goes overlooked, and I try to emphasize this for my students, I'm like, don't, don't just skip Leviticus because in Leviticus, yes, you, you, got, you got some bad stuff, but also in Leviticus, you have this really strong environmental ethos where the children of Israel, the B'nai, uh, B'nai Israel, um, are supposed to uh, take care of, nurture the land, and if they don't, uh, if they don't uh, tend to the land uh, and the land's needs, they are uh, punished uh, by God uh, for doing that. So it's a much different view than what has kind of emerged from Western readings of the Bible. We tend to interpret, uh, we intend to interpret that language as, I think, you know, it's a misreading really that comes from Greek and Latin translations of the Hebrew Bible, reading Mashal, uh, reading, excuse me, sorry, reading uh, Malach for Mashal. So Malach means to rule. This is where we get the word Malach, king from. Mm -hmm. So to rule over and have dominion, that gets translated in the Septuagint um, and in the Vulgate as to lord over. Um, so uh, dominatrix in, uh, in Latin, um, but that is not what you get in the original, um, in the original Hebrew. Um, and so um, I try to, wherever I see stuff like that, I try to emphasize and highlight that um, in my discussion uh, with students. And also in, in my book, there's a chapter uh, in perspectives that deals with kind of the environmental uh, ethos of of the Old Testament, and I think there's a way to navigate that. If you give to, uh, students too much Hebrew, if they didn't go to Hebrew school or something, they're going to get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, in instances where you know, I think this is an excellent example that you brought up, where it is definitely uh, relevant and has had you know nefarious consequences in the way it's been interpreted. Um, I think you can bring in Hebrew, and uh, the the students are able are able to uh, understand that, and they feel really good because they feel like they know a little bit of Hebrew. And I lived in Israel for seven months when I was a child, and and uh, Hebrew is not an easy language, so it's really, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's wonderful. Now nowadays I could say Todaraba and Ken and Lo, and that's it, and that, that's all I remember. Uh, but but let's let's talk a little bit, actually, if you don't mind, about some of your uh, publishing work when. When you're when you're doing it, uh, I I've written books, and I gotta tell you, 
non-academic publishing is very different than academic publishing. Can oh, yeah. you talk a little bit about, because I know there's this notion of publisher parish and all of that, but can you talk a little bit about what academic publishing is and what your experience of it has been? Yes, yes. So um, academic publishing is, um, I would totally agree with you, um, Isolde, is a whole different uh, ball game uh, than non-academic publishing. Just because you have, how can I put it? Your subject, your, your topic is so limited. So um, even if you're dealing with the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, most people who are writing about it are specialized in a particular uh, field. So um, my work, um, I didn't finish my PhD, but when I was working on my PhD, my, sub, my focus was on uh, the book of Job. Now here's the problem which is that everybody who has a specialty in your field is trying to write a book on uh, the book of Job. Same thing in the classics. So um, there's, a, there's a joke among classicists that, you know, everything that's been written about Homer has, has already been written, so there's no need to write anything else. Um, but there's more stuff published on Homer and on the Iliad and on the Odyssey uh, than in any other academic field, including the sciences, including biblical studies. Um, Etc. So you're always trying to your your big task is to try and find something creative and new mm -hmm. uh, within a field that uh, within a topic that has been uh, written on um, extensively. Um, and a lot of times, you're not going to really be able to find anything uh, super new or super innovative. But what you can find, Isolde, is that what you can do is bring your own perspective to it, a perspective that hasn't been brought to, brought to the material uh, before. I think um, in the classics that you see a great example of this in uh, several recent publications, several recent translations of uh, the Aeneid and the Odyssey uh, done by women, Emily Montgomery, I believe, um, but just, um, you know, kind of taking, you know, her experiences as a female classicist and bringing that to her translation of the Greek, and you start to see things. You start to, or you at least start to look at the text in a way that you haven't, um, you haven't ever looked um, at the text uh, before. So that is uh, the main challenge. Uh, that is the main challenge uh, to uh, to writing um, in academia. The second challenge is that everything in academia, for good or bad, uh, gets peer reviewed. So I remember. Um, the first project I ever worked on uh, was a uh, commentary for the uh, same book I'm actually working on now. I'm doing a project on now I mentioned uh, before uh, for the NRSV, um, but um, the, there was a commentary that I was writing uh, for a book called the Africana Bible, which was basically black American perspectives on uh, the Old Testament. And I had to write um, on uh, the editions of Daniel, which is one of the books of the Apocrypha, which is included in the Greek Bible, but it's not part of the original Hebrew text. I wrote my contribution. I had worked on it for several months. I wrote it in 2006, and it went through multiple peer reviews to the point that the final work wasn't published till around 2010. So um, it can take a really long time with all of the uh, reviews and uh, edits uh, to get to get something published. Um, now, the good thing about publishing in uh, academia, I've been working with um, something uh, a publisher, Cognella Press, for about three or four years now. Wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful print and press. Um, they have some great academic stuff. Um, and the great thing about uh, working with an academic publishing is that usually, if you have a good publisher um, like I have they're going to give you access to all types of resources that you wouldn't have even in your own home library. So you get to access uh, databases with thousands and thousands of things. And so you have um, basically a plethora of uh, resources uh, from which uh, to kind of uh, formulate uh, your own work. Um, but it's not an easy process. There's a lot of peer review. There's a lot of um, them saying, you know, this, this stinks, go back, fix this up submit it again over and over and over again mm -hmm. um, but if you get through it um, it can be it can be a very rewarding experience it's so interesting that you said that I'm glad it's a rewarding experience it would make me tear my hair out just because <laughs> what happens when 
someone says, oh, this part is bad or this part is good or whatever, whatever the corrections or notes that they have, what if you disagree? Are, is it incumbent upon you to change it because they said you had to? Or can you st- sort of stick to your guns and go, no, I really believe this and you, you this know, is what yeah, I'm saying? That's a, that's a great question. Um, a lot of times um, what I have learned sometimes the hard way is to pick and choose uh, your own battles. Um, sometimes if I feel very strongly about something. So um, there was a, a whole article that I wanted to put into my perspectives of the Old Testament book on Deborah, uh, who is one of the female judges in the Old Testament. Um, and there was a little bit of um, pushback, you know, why can't we have an article that talks about, you know, the judges in general? Well, I was like, my specific point is to, you know, highlight a female judge. Now we've all heard of Samson, we've heard of Samuel, but we haven't heard of Deborah that much. Mm-hmm. So I pushed back on that and I was able to get that into my volume. Um, other times I've submitted stuff and I've been, you know, I've been like, you know, this work is is so um, important. I at least want to get this subject matter out. I just want to get this perspective out that um, what pops out, what ends up on the printed page uh, looks significantly different uh, than what I first wrote down, but that I was able to get the general idea out. I made some compromises, but I was able to get the general idea out. So you got you have to pick and choose your battles. Mm. Yeah, again, that would make me tear my hair out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I, this is, this is, uh, sort of shifting gears just a little bit, if it's okay. Sure. Uh, this is a little bit about the tools of your, of your trade. So you're, you're a scholar and you're a teacher and you're an author and all of that is great. I worked at NASA for many years. And one of the things that I remember fascinating me, uh, a few years ago, I heard about, uh, using satellite data, they were able to due to the amount of phosphorus in soil, in a certain spot that wasn't supposed to have any kind of previous uh, town or village on it, they found an entire village hidden under 30 feet of soil, yes. essentially. So when you're doing that, and, and to me, that's super exciting because then they were able to find all of these incredible sort of archeological uh, mysteries solved because of why why was there so much phosphorus? Oh, that's because there was a human settlement there. So. So what are the tools that you as a scholar use? Are you using that kind of, of you know, LIDAR or some yeah. other kind of satellite data to learn about some of these ancient uh, historical places in, yeah. in North America? Or are you finding your sources being secondary sources and you go from what some of the other uh, data collectors have done? Mainly secondary sources, um, Isolde, mainly secondary sources. Um, LIDAR is amazing, but usually you have to be working uh, within the context of academia um, to have resources for that. Uh, mm-hmm. Professors, uh, tenured professors spend years writing grants just to get access uh, to that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't have that type of access. I, have, I, I do teach at um, in, an academic institution. Uh, but I don't have uh, that type of, of access. So a lot of my work comes from what some dude with a light with uh, lidar ground penetrating radar um, <laughs> has done and written up about mm-hmm. uh, his or her uh, research. And mm-hmm. so um, I do that. A lot of my stuff is uh, very much old school. I have um, various uh, books on the subject by experts. Many of those experts are my friends. So I will uh, contact them and say, you know hey, you wrote this, is this what you meant? Um, or what can you tell me about this? Um, so um, I basically have a bunch of you know, concordances and uh, encyclopedias and articles um, basically in my library at home um, mm-hmm. that I use. But um, I also, I, I do, uh, the millennial in me also uses digital sources as well. Um, but uh, that's more limited um, than say, if I was a, a tenured professor, I have access to some of that stuff uh, but not as much um, as if I was a, a tenured professor. And again, the nice thing, once you start writing uh, for a particular publisher, um, they will uh, give you um, what would cost you normally uh, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to have a subscription to something like JSTOR or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, they will give you access to that. So I try to take advantage of that uh, whenever I can. Mm. Okay. I, Cause I was just wondering, it's, it's so, I remember doing some of that work when I worked at NASA and seeing some of the results and just, I thought it was so fascinating to watch finding those kinds of, of 
touchstones, I, I, I guess yeah. I'll say, to, to these ancient peoples is incredible. Yeah. Have you yeah. found anything that has just proven false? Have you gone, oh, I had my hopes up and this is just wrong. This is just not supported at all. Um, yes, yes. So um, there was, um, which have been proven wrong before, um, there was a uh, finding in the late 1800s known as the Kindle Hook Plates, mm -hmm. uh, which were supposed to be, uh, which was supposed to be a written document about the history of ancient America. There's a whole story, background story with uh, Joseph Smith um, and the Mormon church with these uh, plates. Um, and uh, people over the years, they were proven to be hoaxes basically um, in like a year or so after they were supposedly found. But people through the years have tried to uh, argue for them, um, for their authenticity. Um, and I really don't see it, which is disappointing because um, it would be really cool if they were real because it gives more insight into um, the history um, of, of uh, ancient America. Um, but I don't think uh, that they are. And, you're, and you're gonna, that's gonna happen um, a lot of times. Uh, mm. So um, sometimes you're just gonna find a dead end and the best thing you can do is just turn around and, and try again. Um, but overall, I've been more amazed by uh, what I have been able to find um, that's turned out to, you know, ha uh, be legitimate mm -hmm. or, you know, have some uh, something that can be verified rather than uh, something that proves to be false. So what's next for you? I know that you're in the middle of writing a book and you're also teaching. If you could do anything what what would you be doing right now what 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 dig would you be on what writing would you be doing <laughs> i would be um at probably at a i'd probably be at the serpent mound mm. or one of the mounds in mississippi um doing uh doing research there if i could be anywhere uh right now so um i would love um native american mounds is is something in the past couple of years that have kind of become my obsession so mm. i i would love to I'd love to be doing that um but uh, yeah, at the present time, um, I am uh, working, like I mentioned, uh, on, the, uh, on the project, the commentary on uh, the additions to Daniel uh, for um, a new project with the NRSV. Um, I'm also a monthly contributor to a magazine, Ancient American Magazine. Um, so I have an upcoming, uh, an upcoming uh, segment in there on the Los Lunas Stone, which people have argued is a hoax, but um, there's uh, seems to be a lot of evidence in its favor, and I talk about that. Um, and then I'm always um, my uh, Latter Day Saint faith is very, very important to me. So I'm always kind of writing, um, either reviewing somebody else's book or giving my own insights into uh, Latter Day Saint history um, and theology. So those are the main things um, that uh, that I'm working on uh, that I'm working on right now. That's lovely. Very cool. Uh, well, I, I, I know that I, I, you and I could be geeking out about <laughs> mythology oh, <absolutely. laughs> for the next six hours, but I know you have a, a life and a day to get back to. So, so I would love it if you would do me a favor and Certainly. can you give sort of your social media links or where if somebody wanted to know more about your work uh, or follow you online, would you mind just giving those so that I'll put them in the show notes, but it's always really helpful to have more than one way of finding the information. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I have, um, in addition to being a full-time Latin teacher at a high school, I'm also a Latin tutor, and I have a web page uh, for my business on Facebook. Um, if you uh, go to Facebook and type in Lingua Classica, that's the name of my business, and I put in a lot of my work um, and just general stuff about Greek, Greek and uh, Greco-Roman mythology on that site. Um, so there's a lot of fun stuff on that site if you're just interested in uh, the Greco-Roman world. Um, I put stuff on there all the time. And then I also have an Instagram account, uh, Adam the Giant Guy, where I put uh, photos of different mounds that I've visited. Um, I put up information about uh, ancient North America and also some fun stuff as well. So there's pictures of my kids and stuff on there as well. So um, those are the two, those are my two uh, main uh, social media uh, sites. Fabulous. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for doing that, Adam. You know, it's interesting. I'm in the middle of revising my next book, and it's a mystery novel, and Roman mythology plays a role, and I had to translate from English into Latin, and it's too bad I didn't know you back then, because it would, <laughs> I'm, my Latin is probably just atrocious, so you might not ever want to read the book, but... <laughs> 
<laughs> I would love to but, read the book. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, Roman mythology plays a big role in the book. So, uh, but uh, but yeah, it was really it was fascinating to go. How on earth do I translate something that is very much modern sounding? The language I was speaking in modern English, yes, and have it sound properly conjugated and the appropriate translation into Latin. And uh, yes. I'm sure that I'm way off, but. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will just have to take a look at it and I'll criticize you if you are. So, oh, no, no would... <laughs> it'll be, but it won't be peer reviewed because you obviously know so much more about this than I do. You're not, I'm not your peer. You're way, <laughs> way past, you're way past what I, what I know how to do. Well, Adam, I want to thank you so much for being on the show and for taking the time to talk about this. This is, it's so fascinating to see how these ancient uh, peoples and ancient knowledge can be really informative to us today. I'm so grateful that you took the time. My pleasure. I, I love talking about this stuff. Th thank you so much for having me. It was, oh, it was absolutely a delight. I have this one last question that I want to ask. It's a silly little question, but I find that it, it yields some poignant answers. And here's the question. Are you ready? Certainly. I will go for it. All right. So if you had a plane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Um, ah, I think I would say carpe diem in the words of Robin Williams, seize the day. <laughs> and the reason I would say that is because so often uh, we spend so much of our lives, you know, thinking uh, that things will happen to us. I'm not saying that good things won't happen to us, but a lot of times, um, I've been guilty of this in the past, um, when we take initiative, we will be surprised at how uh, doors open up for us. Uh, so uh, don't be afraid to, you know, get all out of your day that you can. Oh, I love that. And I love that you quoted Dead Poets Society. It's one of my favorite movies. Oh, uh, yes, me too. Me too. Oh, such so. a brilliant, brilliant movie. And if you haven't seen it, I'm gonna put a link to that in the show notes too, because if you haven't seen it, you need to see one it. of the films you need to see before you die. Absolutely. Uh, oh, completely. Just tremendous. And when I was talking to you about Professor Cameron at the University of Michigan, he was that kind of professor, the kind of teacher Robin Williams is in Dead Poets Society. Wonderful. Cameron Wonderful. was that kind of teacher at the University of Michigan. So that's awesome. I highly recommend the, the movie and also go find the, the works of Adam Stokes and the works of H.D. Cameron and read read the Odyssey because it's a great story, <laughs> regardless oh, yes. of anything else. It's a cool story. All right. Uh, this is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I hope that you've enjoyed today's show. And if you have, I would love it if you would rate and review the podcast. Let me know what you're thinking. Let me know about episodes that I need to have on the show. As you can tell, I'm willing and ready and uh, hopefully able to geek out about all sorts of topics. Until next time, once again, this is Isolde Trachtenberg reminding you to listen, learn, laugh, and love a whole lot. <music>